Well, good morning, church. I've gotten, let me get this. If anyone was confusing us with a, a well-oiled production machine, uh, this morning we probably took care of those illusions. But <laughs> we are still being faithful. We're getting through stuff, right? Amen. Well, I've gotten several encouraging comments from different individuals concerning this ongoing contest with nature that's going on at my house. Uh, and I have evidence here, pictorial evidence from my front yard, that even though I am currently running behind, I am confident that I'm going to win. And since there's no photographic evidence to present the view of the backyard, those leaves don't count because there's no proof that they really exist. But this is not only the, the season for raking leaves, it's the season for our annual focus on church membership and stewardship. And I want to thank those who have given testimonies and everyone who's helped in all of the things that we're doing behind the scenes to prepare for our annual meeting. But the question that underlies this entire short series that I'm doing is, what does it look like to be a follower of Jesus Christ? And really, that's the question for us in every season. That's the question for us every week, even, even every day. What does it mean to identify with Jesus? So we started by looking at Jesus' message. As followers of Christ, we're committed to understanding what Jesus taught his disciples and then passing that on to others. We're not free to invent a new message. We're not free to change what he said in order to fit with popular notions or with current fads. What we have to offer to the world is the gospel. And it has the power to transform us all as we surrender to God's truth. And then we looked at Jesus' movement. What it means to identify with Jesus as a follower it means this isn't a solitary endeavor. To be a disciple means I'm joining with others who are also following him. And it starts by being part of a local church, a community of other people who have also committed to live according to what Jesus said. As we continue following together, God starts working in us, starts growing us up into his likeness, and we become part of something that's far greater than what we can see right around us even beyond what we experience when we come together. We become part of a great company of saints that spans the globe and reaches into eternity. And today we're taking up a third aspect of what it means to identify with Jesus Christ, and that is to identify with his ministry. Jesus did not come looking for followers so he could ride, ride this wave of popularity to a position of power or to celebrity status. He didn't invite people to follow him so that he could say he had the most followers. He gathered followers in order to teach them his ways and then to send them out empowered to do what he himself did. Before we turn our attention there, I want to take a slight detour to an important related point. It's actually two points. Uh, I have often been accused uh, justly uh, accused of falling short when it comes to being practical in my sermons, okay? It's easy for me to highlight the conceptual aspects of the faith. I'm more of a why guy than a how-to guy. But let me try to remedy that a little bit over the next few minutes. I want to share something about church membership here at First Christian Church. And first of all, uh, to kind of echo what Jim said we are very grateful for all of you who consider this your home church. Whether or not you're a formal member, whether you've been here a few weeks or a few decades, our attitude and our practice is to try as best we can to treat members and regular attenders and occasional attenders and visitors as Jesus would treat you. We don't differentiate according to those categories when it comes to being welcomed here, to participating in things that we do, receiving ministry, or, or serving in some area. There are only a, a very few exceptions to this basic stance. If you work with children here at the church, you must be here at least six months before you can allow to do that, and you have to pass a criminal background check. We do that for a very specific reason. Uh, God help us, we are not going to be another one of those churches who fail to protect the children from predators. Predators love to take advantage of churches because we tend to be trusting people. So we have to be careful there. 
And also, only formal members are eligible to vote on congregational matters or serve as elders or trustees or members of the personnel board or governance. But the process for becoming a member is, is pretty straightforward and simple. There are, there are four simple requirements. First of all, a profession of personal faith in Jesus Christ. We say we are disciples of Christ. If, then you ought to be, if you're going to be one of us, then you need to be someone who's following Jesus Christ. That profession of faith can happen at a public service like this, or it can happen in a private conversation with pastor or one of the elders. Second requirement is that you affirm the, your agreement to the church's statement of faith. Because if you want to be a part of a church, it's important to understand what the church believes. And so we ask you to indicate your agreement with that statement. And, and it's a statement that is a fairly standard. It represents uh, one, at least one way to express historic Christian beliefs. The third requirement is water baptism. If you're already a Christian and you want to be a member and you've been baptized already, that's sufficient for our purposes. And if you haven't been baptized, we can take care of that pretty easily. We've got this nice tank right there. <clears throat> and we can baptize you. We also have a pond right up there on KU. I've done a bunch there. Where there's the Wakarusa River. We can, there's lots of places. The fourth requirement is your agreement to support and participate in the life of the church. And if you've been coming to church regularly or you've been watching us online, you've already indicated some inclination to be a part of this church. And so membership is simply a way to formalize uh, your intention. And the process involves three or four fairly simple steps. You start by discussing your desire with the pastor or the elder. Just tell us a little bit about more who you are. We will answer questions that you have and get to know you, get to know your story a little bit better. Secondly, you want to indicate your agreement with the church's belief, signing a copy of the affirmation of the statement of faith. And if you need one of those, there are some available at the Welcome Center. Uh, thirdly, if you need to be baptized, you can arrange with me or with an elder to have that done. And fourthly, then you're welcomed here at the service, and formally introduce the congregation so that we can get to know you, know your name. It's, it's really that simple. That's so if you're interested in becoming a formal member of First Christian, please talk to me or talk to one of the elders after the service or call the church office, email us. We would love to discuss the matter further with you. Um, and if you're not sure of your membership status, <laughs> for some of you who have been here a long time and you're not sure, am I a member or not, please talk to us. We can clear it up. <laughs> it's not all that complicated. We just need to have some conversations and, and, and then we go forward. And, and if you don't want to be a formal member, please know that's not going to change how we feel about you or how we treat you. We hope you still feel welcome and we want you to be a part of our church family. And just because there are occasionally people here who honestly don't know the answer to this question, who are the elders? Uh, several of them are here with us today. I'm going to ask you to stand. I'm going to introduce you so you know who the elders are currently. Lisa Rundell here in the front is our vice chair of the elder board. Hyacinth Self there in the back is our chair. Uh, Jim is out patrolling, or he's home. He's, yeah, he's back out in the hallway there. Jim Self, husband. Aaron Lathram is working, I believe, and Barb Koppel is probably watching us at home. Hi, Barb. Wave so everybody can see who you are. There you go. Uh, those are our current elders and, and myself. I'd also like to say a few things about our stewardship commitments as, as Jim. Basically, I, I might be able to skip some stuff here. He said a lot of things. I've been around church for a long time, a lot of years. Different churches, different sizes of churches, different types of churches, different locations. And when it comes to church finances, um, I've heard some horror stories. I've witnessed some horror stories. I've seen various ways of dealing with finances. Some of them were fantastic. Some of them, eh, not quite so fantastic. I remember as a kid, the church I grew up in would ask each person or family to make a pledge of what their offerings would be for the coming year. <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Got my water. And when I was old enough to do that, to participate, I, I followed along. Thank you. I remember that <clears throat> after I started doing that, we, I would get a, a, a quarterly statement uh, sent to me telling me whether or not I was up to date with my pledge. And it, honestly, it felt a little weird, but, but it, at least there wasn't anybody calling on the phone or knocking on the door, you know, kind of collecting from us. 
I've heard of churches that pressure people to give from the pulpit. I, I know of churches that have manipulated people with guilt or with promises of extravagant wealth that will come their way if they'll give so much to the church. I've known of churches that have to beg for money to keep the lights on or they take up a second or a third offering on a Sunday until the leaders are satisfied that the sheep have been adequately sheared. I also remember hearing a story from one of our elders of a pastor who stopped by their house after the family had been visiting the church for a, some time. Stopped by with what amounted to an, an invoice indicating what amount of money the church expected to receive from them, basically what they owed the church. Folks, that is both awful and frightening. And there's other kinds of abuses, of course. I'm not, I don't want to belabor the point. I simply want to say that is not the spirit of First Christian Church. That is not who we are. Nothing could be further from what we're about than those examples of unhealthy churches and unhealthy practices and pastors. At First Christian, what we want to be is faithful and responsible. Responsible and faithful to the Lord and to the congregation. We believe that prudence is a godly virtue. It's, it's not the enemy of faith. We believe in having financial integrity. And that means we don't spend money recklessly. We don't do things in secret. We don't try to hide what we're doing from you. We don't mislead the congregation about our financial situation. It means that we honor you, we honor your giving to the Lord by treating it as a sacrifice that belongs to God to be used as he directs it's not our money to play with. So when we ask you, if you call this church your church home, when we ask you to prayerfully consider what God would have you give this next year, and then to tell us that amount through a stewardship commitment, we're not trying to coax you to give a certain amount so that we can reach some predetermined goal of X number of dollars in revenue. What we are doing is we are engaging in an act of spiritual discipleship. See, when it comes to being a disciple of Jesus, we all need to learn a few things. We need to learn how to hear from God for ourselves. We need to learn God's principles for living, including how do we manage these resources that we used to think belonged to us until we came to Christ. And we need to learn how to imitate God in everything, including in our finances. And as a pastor, my focus and my job is to help this church grow up spiritually so that we reflect Jesus Christ in all that we do, including how we handle church finances. That's why I call what we're asking you to do a stewardship commitment. And both of those two words matter. We're not just raising money for the church budget. We're not national public radio with another pledge drop. The first and foremost thing we are about is an exercise in stewardship. We are reminding ourselves as individuals, as couples, as families, as a church, that everything we have belongs to God. He is the owner of us, of our stuff, of this church. We are his stewards. We are his managers. We are responsible to him for how we handle his money. It's not ours. It's his. Secondly, it's about commitment. We're not asking you to sign a legal contract so that our interests as, as the leadership are somehow protected in case something happens to you. No. We're just asking you to give us an indication of your intentions. What do you believe God has asked you to give? See, we hold this, that your commitment is first and always to God, primarily. But then we express that commitment to God by making a commitment to the church. Why do we do that? So that we can help you grow spiritually. Living according to your commitments, instead of by your whims and by your impulses, is an indication that I am maturing. And putting your commitment in writing helps you because it requires that you, you, you've got to seek God. You've got to learn how to hear from God. What does he want for you? And then you have to follow through with what he's told you to do. That builds spiritual character. That builds your spiritual strength. 
and telling us in writing what you've committed to do helps us know what we need to do to be responsible before God and faithfully to fulfill the mission of this church with the resources that God has given us. And that helps us all to grow as a corporate church body when we're being responsible. Once again, we've tried to make this simple. You, you've probably received a letter like this in the mail, like, like Jim held up, <clears throat> you know. It has a cover letter in it, nice letter, tells us what's going on. There's a commitment card for you to fill out. Right? You return it. We even give you a return envelope. So after you've prayed, <clears throat> what do we do? You, or if you're married, you and your spouse, you determine what, what do I, we believe God has told us to do and what can we commit to give to the church? Well, that your tithe, and that's 10% of your earned income and, you, and your offerings, whatever you would give above that, that is entirely between you and the Lord. It's not for us to say what you should give. 2 Corinthians 9, 7, one of my favorite verses on giving, says each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give not reluctantly, not under compulsion. God loves a cheerful giver. Not because you've been manipulated, not because you feel guilty, because you've heard, this is what God's told me to do, this is what I think we're supposed to do. And we would appreciate it then if you'd help us all grow up together by filling that out and returning it to the church. You can mail it to the office, you can drop it by, you can put it in the offering box at the rear of the sanctuary. Well, <clears throat> that, that little detour was, was longer than I thought it would be. Um, Aren't all detours longer than you expect? But I think it was important, and it, and it does bring us where we need to be this morning. Because following Jesus is not just about showing up at the meetings. Following Jesus is about engaging in his ministry. Our passages this morning came from the Gospels of Matthew and Luke, and they are clearly focused on Jesus' ministry. When he first announced himself in Galilee after being baptized in the Jordan River by John the Baptist, Jesus began proclaiming his message. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. And then he begins gathering followers, disciples. And people start coming from all parts of Galilee, even from the surrounding regions, to hear this new teacher. It's the start of his movement. What drew those first followers to him? Three things, really. His teaching was incomparable. It was captivating. It was freeing. But secondly, he demonstrated the power of God in setting people free from demonic oppression. And third, he healed those who were sick. They were injured or crippled or blind or deaf. He brought the goodness and the power of the kingdom of God to broken and hurting people. Now, it would be rather easy to take that topic and turn it into, I don't know, 8 to 12 weeks, even longer, it is fully deserving of that kind of treatment. Today, I simply want to make three very basic points based on the text that we read earlier, a couple other verses I'm going to mention in a bit, beginning with the stories of Jesus' healing there in Matthew chapter 8. When Jesus reached out to touch the leper, he declared it was God's will for people to be well. And he demonstrated that it was God's will to heal the sick. When he went about Galilee, healing all who were sick and broken, wounded, the lame, the blind, the deaf, he demonstrated that the power of God was available to those in need of healing. And Matthew makes it very clear. He explicitly says, just in case you're not up, with what the, up to speed with the prophecies of Scripture, Matthew says, Jesus healed these multitudes in order to fulfill what Isaiah the prophet said. He took, upon a, he took up our infirmities and bore our diseases. The scriptures declared the will of God and it was carried out by the Son whom the Father sent to heal us. Jesus never turned away anyone who was sick. He never said to anyone, I'm sorry, I can't heal you because it's God's will for you to be sick. Not once. Now it is true. He did not heal every person who was crippled or diseased in Israel. Once, in fact, he stopped by a pool where there was a multitude of people who were diseased and crippled and ill, and he only healed one man in the whole crowd. Another time there was a lame man. He passed him by every morning, every evening, on his way to and from the temple, never healed him. 
even though he was healing many other people during that same period of time while he was teaching in the temple grounds just a little bit away. But Jesus never turned anyone away. He always healed those who came to him and asked him. Now, there are lots of times today when God does not heal miraculously, maybe stating the overly obvious. Just this past week, I spoke at the funeral of a Christian man from this church, Royce. He'd been failing in health for several years. He'd contracted coronavirus. He died from pneumonia in the hospital two weeks ago today. I can't answer the question of why God doesn't heal everyone right now, at least not easily, probably not adequately, and certainly not quickly. Sometimes it's our own fault. You know, we ignore God's help, we ignore his directions, and we suffer the consequences. Sometimes it's the fault of other people. Like it or not, God made a world in which we are often vulnerable to the effects of the sins of others. Sometimes it's just that we live in a broken world. Something as simple as a, an infected person who doesn't know that she's contagious, coughing in a public place can spread a deadly disease to me or to others around her. Until this world is repaired by the coming of the fullness of the kingdom of God, sickness and disease and brokenness are going to be with us and suffering will be the result. But we never have to wonder about God's will. It is always God's will for us to be well. The resurrection proves that. Heaven's not going to be filled with disease or pain. They are the signs of a broken world in need of healing. What God wants for us is to be whole, to be well, to be healed. If we are not healed right away, it's not because God wants us to be sick, because he thinks it will be good for us to be broken and wounded and damaged and ill. He wants us well. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever wondered why Jesus didn't just stay around after the resurrection? I mean, he popped in and out for about six weeks while he was teaching the disciples how to understand the scriptures that pointed to him and to his death and his resurrection and gave them ample proof that he was alive again after dying on the cross. But why didn't he just stay and keep teaching and keep healing people? I mean... He was alive. He could never die again. Why didn't he just stay? Or to look at the question from a different perspective, why didn't God take you to heaven as soon as you were born again, or at least after you were baptized? Why are you still here? The answer has to do with God's plan to grow us up. Okay? I said it earlier. Jesus didn't gather followers just to build a following. He made disciples, learners. Why would he do that? So they could replicate what he taught them, what he'd empowered them to do, so the church could do what Jesus did. Matthew 10, we get a glimpse of Jesus' program for the disciples. He says, verse 1, Jesus called his 12 disciples to him, gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. Verse 5, these 12 Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. And as you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you've received, freely give. In the middle of his time of ministry in Galilee, Jesus took the 12 apostles. He imparted his authority and power to them by the Spirit. Then he sends them out to teach what he had taught them and to do what they'd seen him do, heal the sick people, including lepers, raise people from the dead, drive out demons from oppressed people. Guess what? That's exactly what they proceeded to do. And they came back astonished and excited. Now, there are some Bible teachers who insist that this was a unique and an unrepeatable situation. That is, these special powers were only given to the 12 apostles and only given for this particular ministry tour. And they would point, for instance, to the commands that the apostles were only to minister to the Jewish people, and that would, they say this is evidence that these instructions were temporary, not permanent. But there's a problem with this thinking. You see, we have no record 
that Jesus ever repeated these instructions to the apostles or to anyone else after the resurrection. And yet we read in the book of Acts, after the resurrection, and after the believers were filled with the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost and on some other occasions, the church continued to do exactly what Jesus had told the twelve to do. They went about healing the sick, cleansing lepers, raising the dead, and casting out demons. Do you remember that lame man I mentioned that Jesus walked past every day as he went in and out of the temple? The very first miracle recorded in Acts, the miracle of healing recorded in Acts, is when Peter sees this man that Jesus had walked past every day, sees him at the gate of the temple where he had been every day, he hears him begging for help, and instead of money, he gives him something better. He gives him the power of God, and the man's instantly healed, as Peter does what he had seen Jesus do. And Acts is filled with examples like this. Healing, and not just by the apostles. But why would the church do these things without any repeated instructions that directed them to do them if those first directions were only temporary? You see... The church assumed that Jesus' earlier directions were still valid and still constituted their marching orders and not just for the apostles. The only thing that was changed was the restriction to only go to the Jews. That had been lifted now in favor of the command to go in all the world, not just in Israel, to make disciples of all the nations, not just the Jews. The night before he was crucified... Jesus told his disciples, John 14, verse 12, Truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. We were brought into the kingdom not just to listen, not just to watch, not just to go to meetings, but to actively do the things that Jesus did, to heal the sick, to drive out demons, to bring hope to the downcast, to bring truth to the confused, to bring peace to the disturbed, wholeness to the broken. It's the reason we're still here, to minister in Jesus' name. What does that mean? That means in his place, in his stead, and by his authority, doing what he did. 2,000 years later, Nothing has changed. And that's my final point. God hasn't revoked his instructions. He hasn't withdrawn his Holy Spirit. He hasn't changed his mind. He is still empowering the church, his church, to do the ministry of Jesus, to bring healing to broken people, to break the power of addictions, to bring cleansing from sin and restoration from devastation that's been brought about by our own stubbornness, our own pride. And the world hasn't changed either. It's still broken, and it's still filled with sick people and disturbed people and damaged people. I guess I do have to qualify that statement, though, because there is one way in which the world has changed fairly significantly, but not for the better. The world's still twisted. The world's still corrupt. What has changed is that we're no longer bothered by that twistedness, by that corruption and that perversion. In fact, there are a lot of people today who are reveling in evil and declaring it normal and insisting that we have to embrace and celebrate our brokenness, and maybe even advance it and magnify it. Jesus continues to minister his love and his healing because he did not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. He did not come to collect the well people. He came to heal the sick. The sad irony, of course, is that Those who rejected Jesus then thought of themselves as well. They were fine. They didn't need his medicine. And those who reject him now think the same thing. Both of them are blind. Both of them are eaten up inside with a spiritual cancer that will certainly destroy them unless they repent, unless they're healed by Jesus. 
So which will you be? Will you be the one who knows she is sick and needs to be healed? Will you be the one who is leprous and knows he desperately needs to be made whole? Or will you be the ones who are sure that they're just fine, turned away from the only cure that could make them well? Which will you be today? To close of today's service, if you would like prayer, we'll have someone in the corner or up here at the front who can pray for you, whether it's prayer for healing or prayer for something else. But you don't have to wait that long for God to touch you.